suburbs have always been quite a, a focal point for permaculture practitioners, um, in a lot of ways activists, not so much designers perhaps, uh, certainly teachers over the decades. Uh, because that's where most Australians live. And there's also a lot of sort of other reasons behind that. This photograph I took in 1983 of Graham and Robin Harpley's permaculture retrofit uh, in Coburg in Melbourne before they moved to Crystal Waters. Um, and Graham Harpley was also one of the uh, people at the start of series uh, city Farm and uh, was a, a close friend and, and colleague of ours and it's interesting that sort of move to the country, move to other, other places that has happened in the early decades of, of permaculture but in some ways I see permaculture as coming back uh, to suburbia. And this is Cat Laver's property in Northcote, not far from there, another generation of permaculture educators and practitioners and uh, uh, communicators who works um, with local government in communicating permaculture and also is, uh, her place is one of the case studies in the Retro Suburban book. I'm one of those people who's actually measuring what she uh, produces, which uh, is a a really good aspect relating to that issue of what research do we have on, on permaculture, even at the most basic scale. So apart from the majority of Australians living in suburbia or suburban-like residential landscapes in our country towns and right through to places like where I live in Hepburn Springs, our small villages, we don't think of that as suburbia but the vast majority of Australians who don't live in our capital cities uh, live in those sorts of similar landscapes of detached houses on residential blocks. And in a lot of the design aspects, a lot of the systems that work, a lot of the behavioural and organisation patterns of households um, also work at that, uh, that scale. If you look at that 93% of Australians who live either in our capital cities or our regional towns and villages, I can't remember what proportion are actually in apartments and higher density, uh, but it sort of takes you down still to about 75% of Australians. But then if you look at what proportion of children live in those suburban landscapes, it's much higher. Uh, because that's, that's where most people, most families are raising children. And that means the next generation that will be dealing with the uh, climate, uh, peak energy, uh, uh, post-bubble economics world and a myriad of other things <laughs> that are coming towards us, uh, that's where they will be gaining their most important experiences that will shape their capacities for the future. And in some ways that's not a, a good look, but the possibilities that we can transform that uh, are very strong. The fact that there are so many houses, so many systems that are actually got the same orientation on the same soil, uh, similar house construction, means the retrofit solutions that are developed in one place, there's a lot of other places where a lot of those solutions can actually just be copied. Now all of us know, who've been involved in permaculture and sustainability for a long time, is that this old mentality that there's one solution and pattern and you just replicate it, doesn't work. Doesn't work when dealing with nature, and it's an inherent problem for moving our information systems out of the industrial mode to this incredibly divergent site and situation specific adaption that we have to do in the future. But the suburbs is one place where to some extent we can copy 
a lot more than we can when we're dealing with farms or a lot of other uh, situations. So that ability for good models to be uh, spread by viral replication is I think very important. Because the future that I'm assuming, people won't have time to faff around with the privileges that we've had to experiment. I'll have to take and grab what works and uh, apply it. And the design solutions are not complex, uh, they're not high risk or require much capital um, and don't require much permission from the gatekeepers of government and of finance. If we look at our broad acre farms, we're talking about scale and size that uh, without a lot of the structures of financing and whether we can imagine uh, community controlled financing that can be alternatives to banks in the future and all sorts of other possibilities, the reality is it's hard on larger scales to actually just, we're just going to do this. Whereas at the suburban scale that is possible. If one has control of that issue of debt. <laughs> so the issue of debt of course is the, uh, the big high risk, there's huge risks in this sense and a lot of the strategies to be able to deal with that are um, to get out of debt. But we also know that, that whatever happens in the future, all of those, that housing stock and those people will still need to live somewhere whoever owns that property and whether it's worth one tenth of what it is currently, it will largely short of catastrophic scenarios, it will still be there. And this is of course the logic that the changes that are coming onto us are so fast, but they're not necessarily fast in the sense of escalating capacity to rearrange the physical world that we've been used to in the past and even allowing for those rates of change, replicating and changing our cities is a hundred year project at minimum. So we are going to be facing these futures uh, with what we've got. And the other important factor is that the density of our suburban areas is not so great that it's not possible to grow a significant proportion of the food adjacent to where people live in the household and community non-monetary economies. And this is very, very important because those economies are far more efficient at doing that function amongst a lot of other functions like childcare, food preparation than commercial um, larger scale systems can ever be. In all societies before our own, the balance between the monetary and uh, economies and the household and community non-monetary economies varied quite a bit but certain types of functions were almost always in the household economies because they were more efficient at doing it. We know from past downturns in uh, economic cycles that as that um, uh, cycle goes down, people start doing things again for themselves. Now they don't start setting up factories um, in their workshop to make antibiotics. No, they use the monetary economy to buy those things, but they do things like look after kids, fix the house and grow food. And even if they're not the most competent to do that, because they can do that, they do that and they keep the money for the things they can't. The other last aspect I suppose is that permaculture has a track record of relevant skills and runs on the board in this field. I think in the terms of large scale land change, uh, you know, permaculture hasn't necessarily been completely at the forefront of, of that change. There's been contributions into it but the heartland of adaptive strategies is suburbia.
when we look at the, the leafy suburbs um, of a lot of the older suburbs where there was smaller houses on larger lots, there's a huge potential uh, for garden and urban agriculture. By garden agriculture, I mean the non-monetary household um, uh, growing. By urban agriculture, I mean commercial uh, activity. So if we look at that available space, it's enormous amounts of available space. And most of it in these older suburbs is privately controlled, adjacent the houses. And the opportunities to grow high value perishable vegetables and small livestock products, the benign climates, and even in spite of things that people would say about soils in Perth, better than average soils compared with rural Australia. <coughs> Not necessarily better than average soils from where our commercial produce comes from. The commercial perishable produce comes off, off our very best horticultural land. But there's a huge amount of soil improvement that has happened in an ad hoc way just by old gardens building organic matter. There's a big variation in what the soil's like in our capital cities, ranging from, let's say, over most of Sydney, pretty shit, to Adelaide, um, some of the best horticultural soil in the, in the country. So there is a big range, and that does affect why some cities, I believe, have phenomenal heritage of uh, garden agriculture, like Adelaide, and while Sydney, do while Sydney doesn't have such a good heritage because soil is a limiting factor. Some people find, yeah, food just grows really well and they get the positive feedback and keep doing it, and other places, it mm, doesn't sort of work very well and don't do it so less, but that, don't do it so much. But that's one of my hypotheses about the differences between uh, our cities. If we look out at our more recent suburban developments, a lot of these seem fairly dim, gloomy prospects, the large houses filling the smaller lots, um, uh, huge setbacks from the street, low, no higher density much in terms of people per hectare than the older suburbs, but huge amounts of public space, enormous amounts of public space. And so that means there is less opportunities for highly productive garden agriculture in the house allotment, but enormous potential for urban agriculture to reconfigure these open landscape spaces. And often those open landscapes have relatively low amenity, uh, uh, some gum trees and other plantings, but they are not the, you know, the really old established parks that exist in our inner suburbs. The capacity to collect surplus storm water out in our rural areas, there is no surplus water. Everything is already over allocated. Into a drying climate, there is less and less water. Ironically, in our urban areas, the more developed they are, the more there is a net surplus of water relative to the available growing space. Of course, that's greatest in our urban cores, where there's very little growing space but more water coming off hard surfaces than can be possibly absorbed in those landscapes. Similarly with nutrients, there is more nutrients in our urban areas than can be possibly fully recycled in our dense urban cores. The, the suburbs are the sweet point where there is uh, more of that uh, balance. And of course the potential for low food miles and greenhouse gas emissions because we know uh, garden agriculture just has way lower environmental impact. But that's not going to be the driver of this change. It's going to be economic transformation. But one of the byproducts that will come out of it is lower um, environmental impact. And it will also conserve our best farmland instead of it growing lettuces for us to eat that we could grow in our gardens, it can be growing our um, uh, more broad acre, high value crops for which we have very limited arable land. 
And just remember that the whole of the West Australian wheat belt will largely retreat to managed rangeland and cropping will die out. So where is that, where are those grains going to be grown? They'll be grown on the better land within those landscapes, the higher rainfall, the closer in to urban areas. And certainly in the east coast of Australia, a lot of those landscapes closer to the cities are currently growing um, fruit and veggies that we don't need to do in those landscapes at all. Now, of course, that will displace a lot of commercial agriculture as you know, home production takes over those functions, but it will free up that land for the things that do need to be grown there. OK, I want to use this chart from, uh, from the book that explains the significance of the suburban scale. This is a logarithmic scale of growing areas from you know, container growing virtually on one square metre through the suburban scale, 100 to 1,000 square metres, up to um, rural residential and commercial horticulture, you know, 1 to 10 hectares, moving into broad acre cropping, grazing and then rangeland, forestry and reserve, out 10,000 square metres. If we look at how soil how much soil is a limiting factor across that massive uh, scale range, then I would suggest that it's most critical, the basic uh, inherent characteristics of the soil that you can't readily change, in spite of what Yeoman said and uh, Darren and others. There are certain characteristics about depth of the rooting profile, the basic structure of uh, the macro structure of the soil and the deep mineral base that's available. That that is really critical for our high value um, intensive horticulture and, and cropping. Down at the uh, container scale, um, the backyard, the courtyard, you can make modified soil mixes, you can just modify all that because you have so much power relative to the scale that you can overcome whatever the substrate is. And of course a wicking bed grown on a concrete slab or a rock sheet where there is no soil just sort of bypasses that limit. Out at the rangeland scale, the plants that are being grown, hardy native grasses, uh, native trees, that are adapted to the environment are the base of the land use anyway. And the limitation there is not soil. It's actually rainfall. So we can see that there's that relationship. Again, in the inner city area, there's so much water, apart from what comes out of the tap, there's so much water that could be collected relative to the growing space, it's not a limiting factor. Sunshine's the other way round. You don't have broadacre farmers saying, um, oh yeah, and what's your um, solar radiation figures at your farm? No, it's how much rainfall do you get? <laughs> um, but in the inner city, the limitation of what, what can be grown is the available sunlight. Even somewhere incredibly sunny and bright like Perth, the effect of side shading of buildings, the limitations of how much canopy you get, and uh, you know, is really determining things. And if we think of the European model of allotment gardens, I, you know, when I first considered that, I thought, gee, it's inefficient having to sort of bicycle off to your allotment, you know, compared with the permaculture, just go out the back door and you know, get a few things. But if you're in a cool, cloudy climate in narrow th three-storey terrace houses with a tiny little garden, the actual light is really limiting. Whereas getting out into a neighbouring field where there's a whole lot of allotments together, the available sunlight actually makes a lot more sense. So if we look at that suburban scale, it's very interesting that there's basically a balance. That is a sweet point where these limiting factors are all about equal. And 
that's the only scale at which that balance occurs. Now maybe that's sort of like a little weird abstract thing, but I think it is very, very significant in terms of what uh, productive potential is. Also want to suggest that retrofitting rather than new construction is the strategic opportunity. That's Roe Morrow's um, dilapidated garage in the place she bought in the Blue Mountains uh, with a, a beautiful retrofit, a little room. Um, and I think the opportunities to retrofit are so much more important than new build because primarily of the immediate limits to debt-based growth. As soon as the bubble uh, breaks, and I'm not going to go into why uh, I think that's going to happen, I think the dogs are starting to bark at now in this country. And I'm, my assumption is that this is the fastest changing factor, far faster than um, uh, resource depletion and far faster than climate change. And that the greatest vulnerability is the value of housing and it's higher risk in Australia than anywhere else in the world. And the threat of zero interest rates uh, and what that does to the financial system as the last desperate attempt to create to keep stimulating the bubble economy and keep it uh, going. And the bank vulnerabilities to real estate and the household debt risk. So what, what a lot of these factors add up to is that basically there, an end of bank credit means an end of financed construction. All of it. The fact that there's supposedly more people in the country from immigration and birth is absolutely irrelevant. If there is not the money, the builders will not build the places. If the prices are falling, no one will be doing anything. And that is in a context where we have more surplus building stock than any society has ever had in history. Empty houses, underused houses, buildings, uh, gymnasia, um, uh, big warehouses, storage facilities that are all capable of being retrofitted to housing. Enough building stock to house 50 million people. The idea that there's a housing shortage in Australia is a complete illusion sold by the housing industry. So. The, there's some other aspects why retrofitting is so significant because it can be done in an incremental way, uh, often under the regulatory radar. And this is important because now the regulatory gridlock that is strangling small scale, low cost, innovative, experimental development is, is reaching a sort of crisis point. It follows some pretty deep historical patterns, you know, going back to the Roman Empire, believe it or not. Um, but yeah, it's a sign of sort of part of the, the end game. The abundant amount of building stock that is capable of being retrofitted but requires sort of creative solutions and that creative reuse and retrofit solutions is perfect permaculture much more than the idea of green uh, um, blank slate uh, design and much lower ecological footprint and impact of, of resources. So I think that uh, is, and I'm saying that as someone who's built three passive solar ecological houses um, and I'm probably in some ways a better Garden, a better builder than I am uh, gardener. But I think food production and ad hoc retrofit of existing buildings is much more significant. The other difference between here and similar countries in the Northern Hemisphere is we don't die in the winter if the gas goes off. <laughs> 
you know, like, okay, yes, some elderly people, you know, not well looked after with no one to provide them with a hot water bottle and whatever might, but gee, even where we live in central Victoria, 500 metres above sea level, the winters are incredibly mild. Whereas in a large parts of the Northern Hemisphere, good buildings that work are a much more critical part of survival. So that's an aspect of Australia that, that also tends to say buildings are not as important as food. There still are remaining new build opportunities. Um, that's permaculture in the bush back in 1980, my, the first house I built for my mother, um, where my memory of it was fancy someone in their late 50s um, single going and buying 180 acres of bush and doing the self-sufficiency thing. How grossly irresponsible I should go and build her a decent passive solar house so she has and set up decent water systems, uh, which I did. That's my memory. Her memory um, in her last years was she'd allowed me to use her money to experiment <laughs> with my crazy permaculture ideas. <laughs> anyway, the result was that house. And you know, in some ways we're still at it. We're partners in uh, um, one of the remaining lots at the Friars Forest Eco Village uh, with um, uh, Hamish McCallum, there's Sue and Hamish in the co-housing house that is being built uh, at the moment. Uh, so there are, I think, some opportunities for new build. And, but I think most of those opportunities are going to be in rural areas rather than urban areas. And mostly based on savings. That's, I've been living like we're in a contractory depression for 30 or 40 years, just do everything from savings, you know, don't borrow anything, that building's being built that way. All the, the, everything we've done has been done without debt. But there will be opportunities for people um, who have those resources to do that. And also because savings in the bank themselves um, further, not very much farther down the track below the collapse of of housing values will be at risk themselves. So that issue of um, what do you do with savings, um, you know, you've actually got to turn it into something physical. And for some people that will be building. The other aspect is the loosening of regulatory impediments. Once the building industry comes to an end, Regulators will loosen the strings enormously. Anything, anyone who's got any money to do any stuff will be pretty much able to do it. And that means some really bad shit will happen. But it also means more like if you go and see what permaculture people do in Latin America, you'll sort of be able to do anything. And of course, if we maintain an ethical constraint about is this fair share, is this care of people, is this care of the earth, then that's good from our point of view. Okay, so the larger concerns that we hear all the time are about, but isn't this encouraging urban sprawl? Those issues are no longer relevant. The bursting of the property bubble will end both urban sprawl and higher density redevelopment faster than the most extreme policy restrictions imaginable by the most ardent uh, proponents of new urbanism that for 40 years have been trying to, how do we stop the, the sprawl at the edge and get higher density development? Well, we're not going to have either. <laughs> so, you know, the concerns about uh, the sprawl on the one hand, colonising agricultural land like I see happening in this middle belt of the incredible sweet zone of high value horticultural land on the 
um, the foot slopes of the escarpment, you know, the faster the property bubble unravels, the more of that horticultural land will still be available. And similarly, the faster this unravels, the more backyards in our current urban areas will still be available to grow food. Because nothing is going to stop governments from constantly encouraging more development. Because that's the, actually the only basis of the monetary economy now that the, um, the mining boom is over. So uh, I've mentioned the unacknowledged scale of this residential building stock and also wanted to mention that the claims about higher density needed for public transport are essentially um, not based on historical evidence. We can look at um, suburban Melbourne uh, with low density quarter acre blocks uh, where tram networks were established, of course with public money, but those tram networks paid for themselves in people commuting to work in those low density suburbs. Of course, if people have the discretionary ability to drive and only a small number choose to use public transport and the number of people living in each house is gone to a fraction of what it was and people have moved from regularly moving from one place to another to just just in time choice to so go anywhere and everywhere yes in that sort of lifestyle and pattern it looks like you've got to pack a lot more people a lot more buildings into a small space to make public transport infrastructure viable and that's one of the logics of the infill development uh, but it's actually not really necessary if people actually used public transport. Of course it's got to be good enough to use. The other thing is the huge underestimation of the potential of home and neighbourhood based work to just avoid uh, commuting at all. You know, people you know, there's all sorts of issues about, well, why didn't the home-based work really sort of take off? Yeah, well, um, but it's, the fact is we actually have the infrastructure in the communications technology, at least in the near future, for a huge amount of home-based work. But a lot of the capacity for home-based work is because we have this surplus building stock. You know, people have got the spare bedroom that can become the office. If they get rid of half the crap in the garage, you can retrofit the garage to an office. Uh, and the decline in conventional employment that's leading to a lot of part-time, home-based, contract sort of work anyway, the reasons to commute uh, are going down. And the underestimation of garden agricultural productivity in suburban landscapes. Of course, there's also another aspect that there's an overconfidence about the ability to maintain the amenity and functionality in higher density city areas in energy descent futures. As soon as you look at energy descent futures, then higher density development is a lot more difficult, especially for a, a society that's in denial about actually making those adaptive changes whereas the lower density development is much more amenable to adaption. So I just want to show that structurally the economic changes where we move from a larger economy but most importantly that most of that economy is what's called economy measured by GDP, uh, the red circle doesn't include the household and community economies, it's mostly controlled by corporations a big sector by small business and quite a bit by government and other institutions. You can have a radical contraction of that which happens with credit freeze conditions based on 97% of the money in circulation actually being not money but credit and that can just disappear like that and does historically. And that is partly replaced by this huge expansion in the household and community non-monetary economies. So that's the sort of structural shift uh, that um, I'm expecting. Also just want to mention that I think unintentional community is a, a, a critical path more than designed eco-villages. 
And in contrasting these two examples of co-housing, Earthsong, which is a fantastic place, and just knowing the years and decades of work that go into establishing places, and even that's before the com internal community development really consolidates, just the infrastructure and legals and financial sort of stuff. And to look at one that's halfway towards the ad hoc uh, um, adapt in situ. This is um, Murundaka co-housing in Melbourne and it was a new build but it was an off-the-shelf design that these developers had. There was money from the government and they just took it and got it and then what do we do with this buildings now that we're here? So they effectively moved into a, almost that retrofit situation of we've got to adapt to what we've got. There's already in rural areas a lot of the new opportunities with eco-villages are actually buying existing um, bankrupt uh, tourist facilities and whatever. This is happening in Queensland, New South Wales, Tasmania that I know of and we'll get that in urban areas too where like massively underpriced physical assets can be bought and uh, people adapt in situ. There's huge advantages to the early adopters. Uh, Richard Telford and his wife, their project, Abdullah House, I can really recommend uh, looking at that online. It's one of the case studies uh, in, the, in the book. We know there's the first choice of materials, choice of neighbourhoods and, uh, and properties um, at, at relatively undervalued. There's the time to reduce debt and other vulnerabilities before adverse impacts. There's the time to engage children uh, in adaptive behaviours at the best age and to take advantage of the social status that's now accruing to eco and retro fashion. And that is a huge advantage which is there now that although the society's not going that direction, it's actually cool to be doing these things if you possibly can. And that's something that we haven't had a lot of over the, over the past decades. And to take advantage of the network community stimulation and support until geographic community and family structures redevelop. Because we have this sweet point at the moment where we can connect to all the like-minded people who are doing stuff to help get going in a future where maybe we'll depend much more on the person next door and down the street than we will with our uh, friends on Facebook. Uh, but we can make use of, of one to build the other at, at the moment. And the opportunity to take advantage in a very Machiavellian sense uh, of natural disasters and other hiccups to help family and neighbours make a shift and gain social credit and leadership recognition in those situations. And I'm very, very serious about that. That's part of my energy descent action planning strategy that just like the elites use natural disasters and everything to shift the public perception. You know, if you can give seeds and a few things to a neighbour after a bushfire or do something because you're better set up and there's a stronger connection with people that maybe previously wouldn't have thought that value, that is social credit that's incredibly uh, important. And just the role of what we need to do is build bigger and better households. This is a case of bigger and better. More people living together is the way of the future. So if we can model how to do that better now, then people forced to do it might have some better models of how to. And the retro suburbia uh, agenda that I've been pursuing with uh, my Aussie Street work is uh, very much uh, reflecting uh, that. So I will 
end it there because I've sort of uh, run out of time very much <laughs> and uh, Josh will be uh, following me. We sort of got started a bit late. But in terms of one of the lead ups to um, the Retro Suburbia book, I want to mention another book that we've just published, The Art of Frugal Hedonism. And this is not anywhere near as radical and out there and feral as uh, what my book will be. But this, <laughs> this is really the book to give to your relatives, uh, to your hedonist teenager or hedonist baby boomer uncle who is still partying and uh, the cost of maintaining the lifestyle is uh, getting a drag. This is really brilliant systems thinking about how to enjoy life a lot more uh, with a lot, lot less. It's very different from anything else we've seen about voluntary simplicity. This is not a tool at all doer. It's an amazing uh, stepping stone. And it's very much part of the agenda we're pursuing that a big part of the retro suburban adaption is actually behavioural change, internal, changing how we think about things rather than retrofitting the built or even the biological environment. It's actually retrofitting the behavioural, uh, the internal space. Thank you.